decomposition by the dot product. Now, decomposition is a fundamental topic in linear algebra. I am talking about linear decomposition. And uh, it's an entirely affine topic. It does not require the dot product. If you remember my linear algebra course, uh, for linear algebra one, we spent the entire 10 weeks doing linear decomposition and in various contexts, first as a decomposition problem, then in terms of linear systems and so on. So the entire quarter was filled with uh, decomposition, but we never once mentioned the dot product. So you don't need the dot product for the concept of linear decomposition, and it's an, it is an entirely affine concept. But you can also do it with the inner product, and it's a very elegant thing, and it is used very commonly everywhere. Physicists love it, geometers love it. It's kind of an obvious second nature type of thing, uh, and everybody should know it, and we're going to do it now. Back to decomposition by uh, the dot product. But first, let me remind you, linear decomposition without the dot product. It's kind of an obvious thing. So if you have a basis, and you want to decompose a vector, an arbitrary vector, with respect to this basis. All you have to do, essentially, is draw parallel lines through the tip of this vector, uh, lines through the tip of this vector that are parallel to the decomposition vectors, which is our basis vector. So that's pretty much it right here, right? And then, let me draw this a little bit more accurately. So parallel lines are more difficult than perpendicular lines. That's better. And then from this picture, it's relatively clear that you need about 1.3 of this vector and about 0.7 of this vector, just by virtue of where these lines land, right? We would need this and this to complete the parallelogram to give us this vector. And this vector is 1.3 of the first basis vector, and this one is 0.7 of the second basis vector. So the components of the black vector with respect to this basis are, once again, 1.3 and 0.7, right? And the concept of parallel and also proportion along a given direction are affine concepts. They don't require the dot product. So that's why I say that uh, linear decomposition is an affine concept. And if you think to uh, interpretation of linear decomposition as a linear system, you know, there is no dot product there. There is no concept of distance or angle or, or anything like that. So it's an affine concept, but that doesn't mean that in the presence of the dot product, when it's available, that we can do better. And maybe it's not better, but it's different and it's very effective. And here's how it works. And against all of my principles, I will start with a Cartesian basis. Cartesian basis is a synonym for an orthonormal basis. The basis vectors are unit length and orthogonal to each other. So uh, the term Cartesian is used because this is what leads to a Cartesian coordinate system. So in two dimensions, you would have vectors that are customarily called i and j. Okay, so we've got i and j, and I think Actually, three dimensions works a little bit better than two dimensions because you can see the overall pattern emerging. So I will also throw in K. Now this is my three-dimensional picture. I and J maybe are in the plane of the whiteboard and K comes out and you're just looking at it from this angle. And they're each unit length. Okay, so that's our basis. And now suppose we have a vector in three dimensions. We'll call it V. Maybe I'll draw it like this. It's hard to tell uh, which way it points, but it points in some direction. And our goal is to decompose it with respect to i, j, and k. So that's our starting point, a Cartesian basis. But then we'll actually move on to an arbitrary basis, and we'll see what changes. This is the simplest situation. And the idea it's is obvious. obvious. If we want v as a linear combination of i, j, and k, then the idea is to take this identity, where i, j, and k are the vectors over here, and alpha, beta, and gamma are our known expansion coefficients, is to dot both sides with each of the basis vectors 
one at a time. So let's dot both sides with I and see what we get. So on the left, we get V dotted with I. And on the right, we have this linear combination. And the next step is, of course, applying the distributive law. And what do you notice? What's the thing that jumps out at you knowing that these three vectors, i, j, and k, are, are all orthogonal to each other? That's right. That's the whole point of it. This is zero because they're orthogonal. This is zero because they're orthogonal. And now you remember that not only are they orthogonal, they're also each unit length. And so i dotted with i is one. So the whole thing equals alpha. So alpha is v dot i. How beautiful is that? So two, well, let me summarize everything that we, uh, that we can glean from this. Number one, to get a coefficient, to get the coefficient of a vector with respect to a Cartesian orthonormal basis, Cartesian slash orthonormal. It's, the two terms mean the same thing. We just have to dot it with the corresponding vector of the basis. The simplest possible thing you can imagine involving the dot products. It's not super surprising because it is uh, sort of like projection. And you saw the affine way, we were sort of projecting. It was an orthogonal projection. So we'll have to deal with that non-orthogonality when we deal with an arbitrary basis. But with an, ortho with an orthogonal basis, yes, we can get them by a single dot product. And the other thing that's very nice, and that's why orthogonal bases are sometimes more advantageous than others, is that we can do it one coefficient at a time. So if we were only interested in alpha, in alpha and not in beta and gamma, then we could just do one dot product and stop there. If you remember solving linear systems, if you wanted to know one of the variables, you pretty much had to solve the whole linear system. Unless it maybe was the last one, you're doing Gaussian elimination, and then on back substitution, you get one of them sooner than the rest. But it was basically a coupled process where you get all of them at once. You're solving the linear system. You're not looking for one variable, unless you were crafty. Here, it's different. It's one at a time, so everything decouples, right? It seems like everything's mixed together, right? And everything's coordinated. You have to get alpha, beta, and gamma at the same time, but in actuality, they all decouple, and you can do one at a time. That's kind of nice. And uh, that's the benefit of having an orthogonal basis. So beta would be similar, and gamma would be similar. Why don't I write it down just so that you have something to look at? And that's the end of the story for a Cartesian basis. Now, what if the basis is not Cartesian? This is where things get interesting. For the application later today, this is all we need. But we got to ask the more general question, what happens if the basis is not Cartesian? Well, let's see. Uh, for, let's first think, what if it's orthogonal, but not orthonormal? What if they're orthogonal, but not necessarily unit length? What happens then? It's length whatever. And k is length whatever, and j is length whatever as well. So we don't know their lengths, we just know that they're orthogonal. Well, this still works, this is still valid, the distributive law is still valid, these still vanish. The only part that doesn't work is that i dotted with i is no longer one. It's whatever number it is, it's the length of that vector squared. So all you have to do to correct it is divide by it. A very familiar combination from doing projections, right? All we need to do is multiply it by i, and that's the projection of v onto the vector i. So yeah, it has to do with projections, orthogonal projection. Well, orthogonal projection works because it's an orthogonal basis. That's why we're doing orthogonal projections, yeah. So it's like, you know, the combination that we so frequently see in the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So same thing for beta. Okay, very simple. So have things gotten more problematic? I'd say no. You know, it's just one little adjustment. We can stay, everything still decouples. 
everything, uh, you can still get them all one at a time by a simple formula. So that's why going for the orthonormal basis is not so important. If you just want this convenience of decoupling, an orthogonal basis is fine. And in many applications, if you've studied Fourier series and you use sines and cosines as your decomposition vectors, uh, unless you want to scale them, which I don't recommend doing, then it, then it is an orthogonal basis, but not orthonormal, and so there is a little coefficient. It's actually 1 over pi, which represents uh, this division, 1 over 2 pi. Okay, now what happens if the basis is not even orthogonal? What happens then? So what happens then is the approach still works, and we're about to see how it still works, but you have to do a little bit more work, and that's really the usually the case when we go from an orthogonal basis to a general basis. I think that from our high school and early college experience, we really try to hold on to orthogonality as much as possible, and we really don't like bases that are not orthogonal, but there's no reason to, to do that and to fear non-orthogonal bases. They work just as well. The complexity is the same if, you, if your notational system evolves appropriately. Uh, the only thing is that uh, there needs to be a little bit more work done, but that's not a big deal. Having to do more work does not mean that a problem becomes more difficult, maybe just more labor intensive. So let's see what happens. So now we have a basis. I've actually erased all the elegant vectors and left the ugly ones. So let's throw them back in. So here is I. Here is J. Don't let your I see them as orthogonal. And maybe here is K. Now, now your eyes can't fool you into thinking that it's an orthonormal basis or even an orthogonal basis. Although I'll bet you, you could take an orthogonal basis and orient it in space so that to your eyes it looks like that, right? You can all, I bet you, you can always find an orientation where if you just looked at the lines, they looked like this. That's my theorem, you know? I can always find a projection uh, where it'll look like that. But that's, that's beside the point. So completely random basis. So what happens? Well, well let's, let's see. Uh, this is still valid. This is, I can dot both sides with I, it's still valid, but now nothing cancels. Nothing cancels at all. So, are we dead in the water now? Let's think like students of linear algebra. We're trying to find alpha, or maybe beta, or maybe gamma, or maybe all three of them at the same time, I don't know. We're just trying to find <laughs> alpha, beta, and gamma, and we have one equation and three unknowns. It's a linear equation, right? These are just numbers, and these are the unknowns, so it's just a linear equation, but there's only one, and we have three unknowns. So are we dead in the water? No, why not? That's actually, that's actually the best possible answer, right? Because you know this question is well posed. That's, so instead of saying has an answer, mathematicians use the fancy term well posed. It's clearly a well posed question. All the information is there, right? We just have to extract it somehow. Yeah, how would we do it? Yeah, of course. That's exactly right. So we've got one equation and three unknowns, but if we dot it with J, it'll be the same three unknowns but another equation, right? Let's point out what's known. This is known, this is known, this is known. Why is it known? Because we have these three basis vectors. Right? We know their lengths. We can measure the angle between them. We can find their dot product. So this is a known number, known, known. Given our vector v, we can dot it with i. Right? Remember, pull out the tape measure, a protractor, get the lengths, get the angles, multiply them together, take the cosine of the angle, you got it, right? So all of these things are known. Only alpha, beta, and gamma are not known. Right? So if I did the same thing and I dotted it with j, if I dotted it with J, I would get another equation with the same three unknowns. And if I dotted it with K, I would get another equation with the same three unknowns. And now I have 
three equations and three unknowns, and I just have to solve that linear system. Okay? Do you want to use your imagination and write down the linear system that you think it'll be? And I'll write it on the board. And then you can look up and, uh, and see if you got the same answer. Did you get the same matrix? Right? First of all, what an elegant matrix. If I had to describe it in words, I would say it's the matrix of pairwise dot products of, of the, the elements of the basis. Good description? That's what this matrix is. Uh, it's known as the Gram matrix from Gram Schmidt, and Gram was the one who was not the Nazi sympathizer. So, fine, you can keep the matrix. Uh, let's point out some properties of this matrix. It's symmetric, right? Because I dotted with J and J dotted with I are the same number due to the commutativity of the dot product. It's symmetric. And you can also prove that it's positive definite. Also, this matrix, the determinant of this matrix on your homework, it was a two by two matrix, so it was the area of the parallelogram formed by the two vectors. Well, this is the volume of the parallelopiped spanned or formed by i, j, and k. So it has beautiful interpretation. It has, and it appears in many other contexts. And it's a very, very important matrix. And you should absolutely get used to it. And uh, if you ever study Riemann spaces or tensor calculus, it's the matrix that's in every expression. It's really the essence of everything that's measured, distances and angles, all of that is captured by this matrix. All of the dot product and its representation, is specifically its representation with respect to this basis, is captured by this matrix. This matrix is the end-all, be-all of metrics, lengths and angles. So it's a very important matrix. And there you go, you've encountered it before. And also, whenever this matrix appears, and you've experienced that as well, you also want its inverse. Remember how you had to in invert this matrix? So the inverse of this matrix plays a role uh, equally as important as this matrix itself and appears just as frequently as this matrix itself. It's kind of interesting. So uh, get used to this matrix, get used to its inverse. Uh, it's with you to stay. When there is a matrix, when there is a Euclidean space and a dot product, that matrix is front and center and will encounter more than once before even though the quarter, unfortunately, is coming to an end. Okay, so, so did things really stop working? No, they're still working. Uh, we can still find alpha and beta and gamma. What we lost is the convenience. But that doesn't mean that we should give up non-orthogonal bases, because quite often you pick up another convenience that way outweighs the inconvenience of having to deal with this matrix. All you need to do is invert it. And when you have to do it by hand, yes, maybe you don't like the task. But on the computer or in concept, it makes no difference at all. So what we did lose is that we now have to find alpha, beta, and gamma all simultaneously at once. We can no longer do it once, one at a time. So that's the one thing that was maybe lost. So this basis no longer decouples. It stays coupled. But even if the basis is not orthogonal or ortho orthonormal or just orthogonal, decomposition by the dot product still works. It's just as elegant. I would argue it's even more elegant because it's more general and you see this wonderful structure. And it still continues to work. So that's decomposition by the dot product. <laughs>